Pour écouter cette session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionner le drapeau français. Hello. Bonjour. Habari Zaleo. On behalf of ICLE Africa, the Africa Center for Cities, our future cities. Surge Africa and the Red Cross Crescent Climate Center. We are delighted to welcome you to the Rise Africa 2023 Action Festival. Rise Africa is a platform that brings together thinkers, doers and enablers to inspire action for sustainable cities. This is the third edition of our virtual festival. It brings together insights practices and visions from across the continent. This year's theme is the cities we want. The cities we want. The cities we want. The cities we want. This mirrors the African Union 2063 agenda vision. The Africa we want. It is a wonderful pan-African call for transformative change. However, the agenda does not adequately embrace urbanization as a potential positive force for improving prosperity, inclusivity and environmental well-being on the continent. We need more emphasis on the role of cities and local action. And this festival aims to provide inputs into this agenda. The cities we have are Expanding Incomplete Inventive Contested Facing impending crisis yet brimming with potential. The cities we want are People-centered Safe and healthy Beacons of culture, unflinchingly modern, and adapting to change and leading global innovation, will make these cities through experimenting, learning, collaborating, and amplifying the everyday actions of people who are shaping their cities. The festival invites you to embrace different ways of knowing. It invites you to forge new partnerships, experiment with new concepts and ideas, to seek ways to bridge science, business, policy, and the arts. Together, let's enter this space in the spirit of poetic possibilities. À l'encre de mon sang, au papier de ma langue, À mes yeux qui tanguent lentement dans le vide, rêvant un jour de laisser des traces de regard sur les villes que nous voulons et imaginons au-delà des verres. Entre deux effluves, mon être crie utopie, mon cœur murmure héritage, mon âme, elle chante avenir. Des villes riches de leur multiplicité, multiples dans leur diversité, uniques. Pluralité niée hier s'est avancée vers un demain déjà avorté. Enracinement certes, mais ouverture dans ce village planétaire. Laisser les sens alerte et réagir. Entendre la cacophonie banalisée des inégalités sociétales criard de laisser en fond sonore. Voir et questionner le décor. Bâtir et consentir à l'action qui sépare le rêve de la réalité. Sentir la fragrance vitale, belle et verte, inévitable baume au cœur, accepter notre responsabilité de léguer à nos enfants un monde en bonne santé, démocratiser le goût, que plus aucun palais, d'aucune bouche, d'aucun enfant, d'aucun pays ne soit plus jamais sec, démocratiser le goût des rêves, des voyages qui s'exécutent, quel que soit l'âge, le long des pages, au fil des chapitres, sur le pupitre de la connaissance, seul germe du choix, toucher l'idée d'infrastructure qui marche allègrement sur le chemin de l'innovation, enracinement certes, mais ouverture dans ce village planétaire, laisser l'essence alerte, mais surtout réagir. Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Ryan Fisher of ICLE Africa, and it's my absolute pleasure to invite you or welcome you uh, back to the third installment of RISE, um, and particularly the session where we're looking to put um, our youth perspectives um, at the forefront of the of our discussions as it's um, imperative to transforming our food system. So again, welcome uh, to the session of RISE Africa 2023, um, and maybe just some house rules um, before we get uh, officially started, just to make the session um, as successful as possible. 
um, just to take note um, of a few of these guidelines. So maybe just to start off with, just to for our French uh, speaking participants and friends, please do make use of the interpretation uh, functionality on Zoom. Um, there should be a French interpreta uh, interpretation um, available there. So please um, do link on to that. And um, if there are any technical issues, please do let us know in the chat. Um, and yeah, just as we proceed with the session, just in order um, to ensure smooth runnings and, and particularly not to, to disturb those uh, presenting uh, specifically, just to for, for all of us to ensure that um, we are on mute um, at all times when we are not speaking. Um, you're of course welcome. And we do emphasize to engage, to ask questions. Um, and as such, you can of course make use of the chat function as please do use me as a soundboard. Um, and of course you are more than welcome to raise your hand as well. We want to make the session as interactive as possible and um, I'll try my best to allow um, for some verbal interaction as well, if time does allow. Um, as I mentioned, for any technical or other related issues, please do just notify us of such in the chat. Um, our technical team on the back end will be um, more than happy to assist. Um, very importantly, also just a reminder um, and a note that the session is being recorded um, and the recording will be made, made available to you afterwards. Um, on the Rise Africa website, which we will share in the chat for your information as well. Um, and then, of course, please do please do engage, um, share our discussion uh, as far as wide as possible. Um, to those of us on social media, please uh, feel free to use the hashtag um, Rise Africa 2023. So that is hashtag Rise Africa 2023 and hashtag the cities we want in any of your posts. Um, and that will ensure maximum uh, traction. So we will ensure that we share those uh, hashtags with you in the churches for your information as well. So again, a warm welcome. Very honored to be hosting this uh, youth-focused uh, session. Um, and maybe before we quick start, I see there's already been some interaction in the chat. Please do tell us where you're coming from. Um, my colleagues will also try to keep us all up to date um, with sharing relevant information in the chat, relevant links to website, etc. So please do keep an eye out there. But please do tell us, please do introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're coming from, where you're joining us from. Um, yeah, that will, of course, grow our network. Um, but of course, also just um, give us a sense of, of who are in the room in terms of our old friends. And also, as we like to emphasize, with the Rise Africa is, is bringing new voices into, into the conversation. So we'd like to see um, who is joining us on the chat today. If you join the the opening session this morning, you'll have seen from the introduction from Paul Karishlai that we have registrants from all over the globe. Um, big uh, delegation from Africa, of course, um, but we are joined from uh, by colleagues and, and friends from across the world. So um, a very warm welcome to everyone. So greetings, you're more than welcome to introduce yourself in the chat as we as we do go along. We have an interesting uh, session for today. Um, not not a lot of presentations, and and deliberately so because we uh, we were quite keen on um, yeah having some inter some open interactive discussions around the topics. But as you would have known from registering and your interest from the session, today is all about centering the perspectives of of our youth um, in terms of transforming our our food systems. I think if the last couple of years is anything to go by, I think it's really it's really highlighted um, the fragilities of our, of our food systems. And I think we, in our discussions, uh, we, we continuously hear, um, you know, the need for, 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 for increased youth particip participation and, and, and voices to be heard um, across this transformation agenda of our food systems. And I think um, sessions like today, um, of course, is, is very important. Um, I want to assume that the majority of us on the call um, identifies as, as youth, um, not not to to exclude anyone from from any particular age group um, or what what um, define us as youth. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, we we have a few interventions, um, three presentations, I think that is, and then yeah, we'll open up the floor, um, hopefully with some open discussion um, as time permits. So please do engage as we go along. And maybe just as we head into our first speaker, I just want to just make an apology on his behalf. Um, Victor is stuck um, at Frankfurt uh, Airport, so unable to join us live for the session, but he was kind enough to share um, a short video intervention 
just to set us on our way. So I'll ask um, our technical lead maybe just to set us off to just play the video for us for, for Victor's, um, our Victor's intervention. And we'll also share uh, Victor uh, his bio in the chat just so that you are aware uh, who Victor is. But Victor is, of course, um, our colleague from FAO um, representing the World Truth Forum today as well. So more information on Victor in the chat. And then, um, Senator Temba, over to you just to, to play the short video intervention from Victor. Thank you. Hello and good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you who are joining us from across the globe. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be among you, especially in this session. Um, so just before I go ahead, ahead of myself and forget to introduce myself, um, I am Victor Mugo. Uh, I come from Nairobi, Kenya, um, and I work with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations um, within the World Food Forum. So if you don't know about the World Food Forum, um, the World Food Forum really is an independent youth-led global uh, platform uh, whose aim is to spark a movement of young people who are empowered to actively uh, transform uh, and shape agri-food systems. Um, so we are facilitated uh, and housed at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, FAO, uh, and by that we are also independent in some sort of ways uh, so that we can support uh, and empower young people to uh, really be the change makers uh, within local and global agri-food systems. So looking at today's topic of discussion, I see three things that are coming up. Um, and one of the things that is coming up is, one, um, local governments, uh, urban areas, cities are really crucial and are almost the centerpiece uh, to global food systems. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, this um, in, the, in the next few minutes. Second um, is that young people although being underfunded, although being underengaged, and although being underserved within the agricultural sector, uh, present a great opportunity to revitalize not only local, but also urban uh, and also global agri-food systems. And thirdly, is that with this confluence of opportunities, uh, I mean, it's time to consider uh, that we center, that we empower, that we resource uh, young people, uh, and also to resource their ideas to resource their innovations, uh, to resource their perspectives, and to center their perspectives uh, in the discussion um, and programs and in the activities uh, on which that, that are driving agri-food systems transformation. And so let me just go to the first point, uh, just showing the link between local governments, showing the link between urban um, areas, uh, showing the link between cities and agri-food systems. Um, uh, I mean, food systems, uh, the agricultural sector, um, just to show this uh, connection. One is that, if there's anything that is very clear um, is that the demographic projections uh, forecast that Africa is urbanizing really, really fast. Uh, in fact, it is urbanizing faster than any other region across the globe. Uh, and with this, it is not, it is not just cities uh, that are growing, uh, it is also food markets that are growing. Uh, if you look at the composition of uh, the growing cities, you will notice that it's young people who are getting into the cities. Uh, and so with this, so African cities are really presenting a large and then tapped reservoir for agricultural markets um, within our, our agri-food systems, uh, showing that we can be able to um, ensure that uh, agri-food systems can be able to thrive because um, 60 million Is that it? Okay, so it seems Victor was cut off short there. So I think we need a little bit of uh, catching up, maybe, and following up um, with Victor. But I think, yeah, I mean, interesting points, even just in that short video um, around the sort of three key themes around, um, you know, our cities are as, as sort of hubs and opportunities. Um, you know, I think, particularly if you consider it in the African context, you know, being, you know, the fastest growing center. I think youth people at the center um, of our food uh, system transformation and maybe, um, you know, thinking about a little bit about those, those sort of untapped opportunities, really. Um, and then this sort of third point around it, sort of taking that second point into consideration and how do we then sort of mobilize and power and resource our young people 
um, to, to, to empower them to be part of this um, food system transformation journey. So yeah, maybe in Victor, for Victor uh, in his absence, maybe a big thank you for setting, um, setting us uh, on our way there. And maybe um, with that, I'll, I'll hand over, maybe call upon um, our colleague uh, Tula, who's uh, made herself available to join us today. Um, looking very much forward uh, to, to your intervention. Um, and maybe uh, as we did with Victor, we'll share uh, Victor uh, Tolu's bio in the chat as well. Uh, but just a short line on, on Tolu, she's the uh, clinical uh, director of research and lead of the global diet and uh, activity research group uh, with the University of Cambridge. Um, and maybe more um, on that in the bio in the chat. But uh, Tolu, we'll call on you uh, to just share with us your intervention around the team today and hopefully spark some interesting conversation. So, floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, just sharing my screen. So I am tasked today to talk a little bit about um, our experience um, in some of the work we do, we've been doing in um, uh, to make the urban better, which is what we, how we describe efforts to um, design planetary health, so design health um, and climate resilience and sustainability into our cities. I've actually, well, two things. One, I've actually titled my talk "Centering the Majority um, and Not Centering Youth." Because I uh, I am conflicted uh, with the word youth, with the word youth in the African context. So imagine if you were going to a imagine if you were going to a medical conference and then someone says, "Oh, the good news is we're delighted to have here a group of doctors that will be will be uh, speaking to us for a few minutes," and you'd be thinking, "Well." It's a medical conference, of course. I was hoping there would be some doctors of some sort. Um, similarly, on a continent where the median age is 19, I almost feel like the word youth is redundant um, um, insofar as it's often talked about as a particular niche group that it's nice to engage. And I just think, well, if we're not engaging with youth in the context of Africa, then I'm really not sure who we're talking about. So I um, consciously titled my talk Century the Majority as a reminder that this is not a this is not a nice to have, but it's it really is a, a necessity if we really are to leverage um, the transformative potential of our demographic dividend on the continent. Um, the second thing um, is I'm going to be talking about uh, an approach um, that we have taken, so not specifically focusing on food, but at the end I'll show you kind of how um, how we fit in and really thinking about an approach to how we can leverage this transformative potential and ensure that the, the majority are actually centered in these efforts. Okay, so here we go. Here's the opportunity and Paul alluded to it um, earlier or somebody did in the, um, one of the intro video. We know that we have this agenda 2063 of the Africa we want that's set up by Africa Union. Now, remember when 2063 sounded like a long time away. <laughs> long time away. <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's 40 years away, right? Um, it's not that it's not that long, all, all said and done, right? So it does include um, the um, a goal around inclusive, sustainable cities. It does include health and well-being, but the pathways are, are fairly unclear, and and our urbanization goals and approaches at the moment are clearly not uh, aligned to prioritize health and sustainability. And this is not going to magically happen. We're not just going to develop quote unquote, and then suddenly we will be healthy and sustainable. It has to be, des has to be by design. And so we ask, um, the question that kind of drives us is, is what if um, access to health enabling and um, climate resilient environments in our cities was essential guiding principle of all urban development. Now, I don't know what cities are represented here on this call, but um, I would challenge anyone to, to, um, to say um, in the chat, and I'll try to have a look, if you think 
in your city, this is the primary purpose or this is what is driving urban development? And if not, why, right? And then the second question we ask is, what if the majority demographic led the way in shaping these cities um, for health and for planetary health more broadly? Um, and, and, and part of what we do is look at what evidence is needed to support this vision. Now, um, a few years ago now, three years ago, I wrote this uh, piece on the on Marshall Plan for Planetary Health. And this was provocative because obviously um, the Marshall Plan was something that was uh, developed after the Second World War in Europe um, to, to support the development um, of the continent after the, it was ravaged by the war. Um, and this was in 2020, so in July 2020, when we were at the height of the pandemic and we we're talking about the need to start thinking about how we rebuild. And, and I thought, well, well, what if actually this was um, something that we were working towards? What if as a continent, we had this master plan for planetary health? And by planetary health, I mean the human health and the ecosystems that we depend on. So can you imagine if we had this vision that was actually um, shaping our recovery, shaping our development, what would that look like? And these conversations actually would take started taking place um, at the at the regional level. So um, the Africa Development Bank's um, think tank, the Africa Development Institute, held this over a couple of days, this um, dialogues um, to look at how we can build um, uh, health systems, build resilient health systems post COVID. And the provocation I added to that was a couple of things to say we can't, we, there's an opportunity here to um, look at health systems beyond healthcare. Um, why? Because one, we're a very young continent, so we should be thinking about keeping health and not just framing health around disease. But secondly, we're already starting to see this high um, increase in, in illness in, at increasingly younger ages and preventable diseases. And, and you can imagine the potential for that to stymie our development. So some of the things that came out from, from that, um, that consultation was things like, what if all ministers had a planetary health portfolio where they could consider human health and ecological impact in any decisions they take, right? Um, what if health was everybody's business and we took this um, systems approach, whether it be health, agriculture, environment sectors, and we talk, talk about planetary health. And importantly, um, the importance of meaning, meaningfully engaging the, the majority was something that was highlighted. So I just wanted to pull out that this was conversation that you know in 2020 when we thought oh anything is possible we can adapt these are the kind of things that we're talking about and so it's not something that we that is futuristic or something that is impossible but something that it really we need to get going on now so urban better is um is the umbrella um uh platform um that uh the work that i will share with you is 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 couched within it's a it's a global urban health practice learning collaborative and advocacy platform and what we do is connecting and mobilizing individuals communities and organizations to really look at how we health proof the future of cities and how we future proof um, um health in the context of planetary health and critically um our motto is that this is youth privileged and centered and, and Africa led. The vision is that uh, aligned with the 2063 vision that by 2030, uh, uh, 2030 seemed like a long way away when I wrote that, um, but this is seven years ago away, that we like every new urban infrastructure initiative in Africa will design um, deliberately planetary health into the city, into the cities. And that by 2063, this is something that is led by the majority demographic. So what do we mean by um, planetary health and what do we mean by how we make the urban better? So the way that we're rethinking this is primarily focused on public space and we look at different elements of, of elements of public space that we know impact sustainability, that we know impact um, climate resilience, that we know impact population health, which is the air we breathe, our places and spaces and the food we eat. So our challenge is, is our challenge to everyone is like, can we actually think about these um, and all the uh, sectors that follow as critical health infrastructure? So air we breathe because we know air quality is both, both impacts health and has implications for climate change and climate action. Our spaces and places because we know these built environments um, shape how we move, um, but they also shape our vulnerability to climate hazards like heat and flooding, etc. But critically, the food we eat as well, 
of relevance of, of most direct relevance here because we know <clears throat> greater access to to healthy um, foods and reducing consumption of, of processed foods is critical but that we also need this climate resilient food environments and food systems to reduce the threats to habitat and biodiversity loss so this is the universe that we're working within right um, and I, I may come back to the to this at the end the fourth element of public space, um, which is a cross-cutting one um, that we look at, is our civic space, because we recognize that in order for, to leverage that majority, we really have to ensure that we are broadening that civic space and we're seeing any efforts um, to take action and to, um, to, to, trans to sustainably transform our cities really has to be embedded within one of inclusive participatory uh, decision making. And so civic space is a critical component to that. This is just, just an easy mnemonic for you to remember the way we work in terms of urban better is we aspire, inspire, and conspire. And what I will show you um, as a direct example <clears throat> um, of some other work we've done in this kind of participatory approach, I will kind of map against this. So aspire because we can't start to transform what we cannot imagine, right? So we have to we have to build that world, and we have to imagine and reimagine what cities could look like. Um, uh, we have to be equipped to for that reimagination. We really have to shape uh, new norms, um, inspire, and that comes from um, data and evidence, right? So we need the kind of participatory infrastructure to enable us to tailor advocacy, to inform decision making, and to really push the boundaries of how we generate evidence and train the next generation and conspire because this this is a monumental task right so no individual is going to do this and we need a connected um, uh, collaborative community that is equipped to to mobilize and, and organize evidence-informed campaigns to connect with each other and share tactics so that we're not making new mistakes but we're building on each other's experiences to be able to work together to design um, solutions um, and to and to really drive the evidence generation in service um, to the sustainable transformation agenda. So that is what I'm going to, that is just a bit of the context. So zooming in, our flagship initiative is the Citizens Initiative, right? So Citizen Sciences for Planetary Health. So I will, I will zoom in on one um, example um, of how we are aspiring, inspiring and conspiring to make the urban better. The Citizens for Clean Air um, is uh, our experiment in precision activism, um, as we call it, uh, for clean air and healthy public spaces, i.e. how can we um, uh, develop uh, data stories that we can use to tailor the ways that we um, activate and um, advocate um, for these healthier and more sustainable spaces. This Citizens for Clean Air works across two of the Three um, or two of the three of the four spaces that I mentioned. So in terms of the air we breathe, because it's focused on air pollution, but also critically our spaces and places, because it's fashioned around physical activity as an important healthy behavior, but that needs to be a supportive environment, and critically around civic space. So what did we do? We worked in three cities in, in, in Lagos, Nigeria, Accra in Cape Town, uh, um, Accra in Ghana, and Cape Town in, in South Africa. We recruited um, a subsample of the majority demographic in each of these um, cities um, who were passionate about climate advocacy, passionate about healthy environments, and, and passionate about running, very importantly. Um, we this is what they this is what they look like. Um, you've heard enough from me. Let me let me introduce you to them. Good day. My name is Olaf. My name is Fisher Zenti. My name is Kiara. My name is Onome. My name is Lisa Savisa. My name is Michael Dalton. My name is Luma Hi. My name is Ruby. Hi. My name is Wazrimi. That's what I work at. Hello. My name is Nell Bensel. Hello. My name is Ron Postman. My name is Mary Hello. My name is Sunny Kiban. My name is Kimilo Bajai. Okay, so that's a subsample of the uh, of some of the uh, 
the run leaders that were recruited. Um, they came together um, in, a, in a workshop to really start to do that world building, right? So what are the issues that our cities face? You know, what are the root causes and what are the challenges? What are the things that we will need to do to address them? And they started building that world. Well, what would the ideal um, city look like, right? So if you if we could do anything, what is the city we want? What is the city we deserve? So this was really the first phase of kind of starting to aspire, right? We then, um, they then designed running routes. Um, they're equipped with a wearable air quality sensor here and the, and the digital platform that we've got to then capture, to mobilize their peers, right? Um, and go on a run and capture the air quality um, with the sensor, but also photos, video, audio of aspects of the environment that either made it hard to run or were sources of clean air or sources of polluted air. So this is an example from, um, from Lunga in Thailand. Okay, so this is an example of what we talk about when I talk about inspiring, right? You're starting to generate evidence um, using participatory tools. This is what, um, this is a hodgepodge of what that starts to look like. So we bring together the data from the census and from the, what the citizen sciences have captured uh, to understand, well, what, are, if we, what is behind the numbers, right? So it's not just a number data, but actually what, is, what does that look like? What does the lived environment look like? And is this is a health risk, is it a health benefit? How is this distributed tools uh, across the city and between cities? Again, this is kind of inspire. And then we start thinking, well, what are the kinds of things, what are the kinds of things that we see that um, are sources of, of, air, of air pollution in this case, right? So this is some of the, what they had to say. Yeah, but it's a very busy area. So the amount of pain is in that case. And major causes of air pollution in Yaba is toxic emission, very close. The main issues with pollution is definitely the amount of car traffic around. The main cause of pollution in my area is wood burning, car emissions, the major source of reduction in air quality in my neighborhood is um, from car exhaust, especially during the rush hours, so in the mornings and in the evening. The main source of air pollution in my area is probably cars, buses, and taxis. The main cause of pollution in my area is food traffic, burning of refuse, and then releasing of fumes from exhaust pipes into the air. Main cause of air pollution in my area is from vehicles. The major activity is sound, which is not able to be sound. As a result of this region of sound, the air pollution in the area is very, very high. And uh, I should say that any cause of air pollution around my area should be this I mean, I uh, wouldn't have the same. So, and the major cause of uh, the air pollution in that environment is more of uh, transportation and uh, open burning and generator fumes. And some of the main causes of Air pollution in Lagos, uh, one of them is in George Bell. So many sources of pollution in my environment, some of which include open burning, open burning of waste, and open cooking using charcoal, firewood, um, waters. Then you also have exhaust fumes from mostly generators and sometimes cars or cars tricycles. They also have cases of poor waste management and sanitation in some areas and through the area. Okay, so you can start to see they're trying to kind of use the data they generate to understand, well, where is that, where is this, where's the issue coming from? It then came back together to look at the results. So what you can see kind of going from the left to the right to the top is looking at the results of what they found and trying to see, well, what are the key issues here? And what, is, what are the key messaging um, that, uh, what does the data tell us in terms of what key, um, how, we, how we tailor our advocacy and our, our activism around that? And that is what um, informed how they designed the, um, 
the uh, the campaigns. They then mobilized again and organized these runs um, to collect, um, uh, to raise awareness, but also to collect all these um, photos. And you can see this is a combination of inspire using the data and also conspiring, starting to mobilize and, and use the evidence um, that they generate to inform campaigns. And then on in on COP27, during the week of COP27, we had one day where we went, had clean air COP27 go viral because they used all those photos and they pushed out um, uh, the messaging that they had developed from their data. Um, at, at, at the height of it, over between October and November, we reached this reach almost 2 million people. Um, uh, they also had an exhibit at the COP27. Where <laughs> What well, this is essentially them showing the data to government officials and cities say, this is what we found, this is some of the issues. They presented, right? Um, and they even organized a run, right? So again, generating data locally, just to show how critical it is that they are part of that solution. They design policy prescriptions, as we call it, based on the evidence to say, this is what needs to happen. So we need real-time access to data because we realize this is an issue. Um, they produced a report um, and, and really importantly, as part of aspiring and changing that conversation is partnership with, um, with media, right? So this was featured in The Guardian um, recently about this precision approach to activism based on Waziri, one of the run leaders in Lagos, collecting air quality data during uh, uh, the Lagos Marathon um, and covered on Al Jazeera. Um, so really you can see how we, they, this, this um, majority demographic are starting to shift the norms. They're collecting the data to data stories that they're using to augment and shape the, um, the vision of the, of, the, uh, of the city they want. And they're conspiring, mobilizing and organizing their peers to really elevate and drive our demand for action. So this is the question I asked at the beginning, and we can. Uh, and what I wanted to show is that if we are deliberate about the methods and our approach to centering the majority demographic, suddenly this doesn't seem like a, a long way away. Um, and and really, in order to um, make the urban better and shape the cities we want. Um, it's really critical that we have these participatory approaches um, to, to working with youth. And I'm really, really excited to hear about the, uh, the AFRI Food Links Youth Ambassador Program. And, and we look forward to um, hopefully collaborating um, with you on this to look at how we can leverage some of this participatory infrastructure um, for the food environment as a really critical part of, of, of making the urban better. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Tolu. I think that was definitely inspiring. Um, I just love the urban beta model. Um, and I really have some questions popping up just in terms of um, the learnings, maybe the, the outcomes. I saw there was a slide with some recommendations, but you know, maybe what are sort of some of those tangible learnings, maybe for for upscaling. Um, you know, I think I think I'm with you in terms of, of of looking at you know improving and transforming our food systems, perhaps through these intersectionalities. And I think just the lens of health makes so much uh, sense. Um, yeah, and also just yeah, the you know majority over youth. I think you know that's that's brilliant. You know, I think you know the, the question then begs, you know, are we doing enough as the majority? Um, you know, and 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 where to from here? So I think um, thank you very much for setting the scene, and and I agree. Also looking forward to. Um, to hearing a bit more um, about the food links, uh, and of course, looking forward to welcoming you on onto the project. But yeah, maybe with that, I'll, I'll call on my colleague, our very own Sinatemba Mtetwa, to tell us a little bit about the project, um, and zooming in specifically onto the Youth Ambassadors uh, program, which I think is really fitting for our discussion here today. So, um, thank you, Tolu, and uh, over to you, Sinatemba. Thank you, Ryan. Um, just double checking, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. As Brian has mentioned, my name is Sinatembam Tetwa, and I am a professional officer at Italy Africa in the food systems team. I also coordinate the Youth Ambassador Program, which is under the AFRI Food Links Project. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so Afri Food Links, which is transforming Africa's urban food environments through strengthening linkages between food system stakeholders and cities across the continent and Europe, is a four-year EU-funded project. Uh, it is coordinated by ICLI Africa, and it has 26 project partners. So what Afri Food Links aims to do is to improve food and nutrition security while delivering positive outcomes for climate and the environment and building social ecological resilience in more than 65 cities. So this is 15 African and five European hub and sharing cities, as well as over 45 network cities. And it aims to do this by one, promoting public shifts to sustainable healthy diets, two, transforming urban food environments through real world social technical experiments, three, promoting inclusive multi-actor governance to empower public officials, establish and informal um, small businesses, communities, young, youth and women with ownership and agency to shape their food systems. And finally, by accelerating innovative women and youth led agri-food businesses to support local value addition and inclusive economic participation. So the project seeks to create a safe space for its ambassadors and all project partners to carry forward the message um, irregardless or irrespective of gender, of race, of sexuality, age, or any further social identifications. Um, as I have mentioned, um, that Afri Food Links does have <clears throat> project cities. Um, so we have five African hub cities. We have Cape Town, which is in South Africa, Kisumu, which is in Kenya, Mpale, which is in Uganda, Wagatugu in Burkina Faso, and Tunis in Tunisia. Um, we also have other African sharing cities, other European sharing cities, um, some network cities in Africa, in Europe, um, as well as in the global south. Um, <clears throat> so um, to carry forward the message of Afri Food Links um, in a way that demonstrates inclusivity, um, Afri Food Links hosts a youth ambassadorship program. And this program aims to create spaces for youth to exercise their right to meaningfully participate in the development as well as in the transformation of their communities um, to promote inclusivity and to break existing youth stereotypes and mistribes and mistrust, excuse me. Um, also, it's important to remember that Africa is regarded as the world's youngest continent, and increasingly this youth is in cities. Also, the median age of Africa is 19.5, while the median age of decision makers is 65. So this indicates that youth's voices uh, are not as loud as they should be in African food systems. And so the youth ambassadorship will give youth the opportunity to engage with decision makers to ensure that the voices of youth are included in decision making processes. And it aims to, to do this um, through multiple ways. Um, just to name a few is that uh, the youth ambassadors will be invited um, to intergenerational dialogues where there will be city leaders. And here they will develop a series of youth declarations to be shared at key international forums, such as COP um, and the urban for and the world urban forums. So youth will become the spokespersons for African innovation for promoting healthy and environmentally food, environmentally friendly food environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, currently we are in the process of selecting uh, youth ambassadors. So in March, 
um, we put out a call um, for interested youths to apply for the youth ambassadorship. And these youths um, were to be based in Cape Town, Kusumu, Mbale, Wagadu, and Tunis, which are our hub cities and cities that the project aims to direct in um, invest directly in and the youth were required to be between the ages of <clears throat> 18 to 30. Um, also uh, as part of the requirements youth had to show uh, that they are passionate about food, they are passionate about the environment, and they are passionate about the cities. This had to be evident on their social media platforms as these will be used throughout um, their ambassadorship to make noise on the project, but also to make noise on different initiatives that are on ground that are very much youth focused. So um, we did receive quite a number of applications from youth, um, from our hub cities, more than 60 applications. And uh, many of these ap applications did demonstrate that a lot of youth really do have a deep passion for food. Um, and some of them were even qualified professionals within the um, food systems sector. Um, others are very much involved in community initiatives. Um, and so because of this, we do not doubt that we really will find um, quality candidates to represent the voices of youth um, in Africa. <clears throat> uh, we hope that uh, by the end of the project, the role of youth in decision making really will be recognized and that the stereotypes against youth are <clears throat> combated. Um, we really hope to capture uh, inputs from those who the future inheritors of our cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Netemba. Looking forward to you know this youth ambassadors program. I think um, also so for the whole project. I think I think it, it bodes it bodes well for I think our food systems, our urban food systems across the continent, uh, just with a mix I think of cities. And as you mentioned, we're very excited for our youth ambassadors who um, Sina and I and the team has a very um, difficult job of of choosing the best um, candidates, obviously to take uh, with us on this journey. But I think more so, um, yeah, I think important just to put youth and what they're already doing um, on the map um, through through the Urban Beta Project um, or initiative and others. Um, and I think definitely urban uh, Africa food links will definitely elevate um, these kind of initiatives um, to new heights. So looking very much forward to that. And maybe uh, while we are digesting the, the interventions, I just wanted to, to check if there's any questions or comments um, from the floor. I definitely have one or two for, um, for the speakers, but um, we are looking good for time. And as I mentioned um, at the start, we um, would be happy to take one or two maybe verbal uh, questions or comments. So um, I'm just looking around. Um, you're more than welcome to raise your hand. Um, if you do want to make an input or ask a question, we do welcome your participation. Any comments, questions to our two speakers? Maybe hearing none, uh, Tolly, if you, if you will, I mean, I, I sort of started with, with my question post your presentation, just in terms of maybe some of those sort of more high level learnings or outcomes from the um, from the initiatives, particularly in the, in the free Africa cities. Um, you know, anything that sort of stands out, particularly on the back of maybe Sina's presentation or I think sort of anything maybe glaringly um, of interest for this conversation, um, if at all, and then I'll keep manning the the chat and hand today for any questions. So turn it over to you. So do you mean anything that, um, was there anything that, I don't know, sorry, could you reframe the question? I wasn't, I didn't quite get from, your From the question. urban, yeah, so, so from the, 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 the pilot, the urban beta pilot, yeah, just any sort of learn, just in terms of scaling it, I think as mm, a model, oh, I, I yeah, think it's, yeah. a, it's so inspiring. Um, and I think, yeah. you know, something that, for example, the, Every food and youth ambassador program could potentially take on board some of those learnings. Yeah. So just some of those. 
No, definitely. I mean, I think, and and the the phase that we're we're getting into at the moment is one of um, is one of scale, right? So, in order for this to be, you know, last year was really testing out the model and experimenting with different um, forms from how we collect data to the, the the digital platform to the best ways of bringing that together with um, key decision makers. Um, so, so what. So some of the reflections and the key learnings that we picked up along the way are things that we're applying um, going forward. So really important to um, recognize firstly, when we're thinking about this kind of participation, that there are different tiers of participation, right? So um, part of the reason, again, I don't like the word youth because it, it implies this kind of people just sitting around with nothing else going on and waiting for you to call on them, right? So, you know, our experience is that the, 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 um, uh, the stage of life and what people were doing varied very widely, right? From people studying to people um, uh, working, uh, working in government, working in uh, the private sector, uh, we had athletes. And so, and so to recognize that actually um, to have some flexibility in how people engage, and, and build that in was something that we was something that we really learned. So actually going forward, this is one of the things that we're considering. So how can we have different um different approaches and, and not and not assume that anyone every everyone uh can come anytime for anything, right? So because people have uh different levels of commitment. The second was in thinking about sustainability of the um of the uh, of the intervention it's really important that it moves from a, a project to something that is institution, institutionalized within the cities. So we're moving to one of looking at partnerships on the ground. So partnerships, both with civil society, with academia and with governments to look at, well, if this is generating value, if we're serious about um, really getting these perspectives to inform and, sh and shape um, our decision-making, then we have to make space for it. Um, in our institutional processes, right? And so it's not just at the whim of, oh, the project is over, so this thing is done. Oh, this new project is coming up, it kind of comes up. So how do we actually build that um, capacity um, within our institutions to ensure that this is something, this approach is something that is embedded? So this is something that we're experimenting with um, um, at the moment. But lastly, um, again, as part of the scaling, we are going to be, and this is why I mentioned um, that I was excited about the, the Youth Ambassador Program, um, is that we are now working on these um, demonstration projects to look at now that we've tested this, this out, how do we um, scale, uh, make sure this infrastructure is readily available, but also making sure that the training um, the, and the equipping is readily available. So we're working on, um, oh, can you hear me? Okay, my internet is doing something. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, that, the, that this training can also be, you know, very, resource intensive come together and sit together but then we have to make sure that this is something that can be that can be scaled in the um going forwards so so maybe those are some of the lessons but fun i think maybe the last thing is that it, there really is incredible appetite that i that we that we experience within the city um governments right for this approach and it's important that we don't see government and policy as this monolith oh we need to convince them to we find that once you peel open a couple of layers, there are always champions within the government, within the city that are really trying to push this agenda, that are really welcome to. It. And it's really important that we take that mindset into saying, well, finding our natural partners and looking at working together. Um, uh, and so ensuring that we don't position ourselves as, as, as adversarial in a sense, because that doesn't recognize the work, the really incredible work that in a lot of cities, um, they're striving to do often against the odds. Right, absolutely. Yeah, on the back of that, I think, I mean, positive, as you mentioned, is sort of last point, it's sort of this wealth of of, of existing interest from, from youth. And, and also, I think, you know, as you mentioned lastly, also, you know, building on a lot of existing 
um, what's already happening. I think you know that's a form of, of empowering or keeping the youth empowered as well. I think that's that's quite an important um, point to make. I see there was a there was a, a question in the chat around institutionalization, and I think you you touched on some of those points um, already. And I just wanted maybe there's a there's a sort of response to that. Um, or any other sort of uh, additional comments or questions that that anyone from the participants wants to wants to add? You're welcome to unmute and then share your thought. I should say that they were. I don't know if they still on there, but they were one or two of our citizen scientists on the call earlier. Um, and if they are still, I know that they, they weren't able to stay a full way, but if any of them are still there um, and you'd like to share maybe some experience, your experience, I think that would be, um, if, I, if, if I may, Ryan. Um, Absolutely. Because they had the firsthand experience, right, of doing this. So anyone, any of the citizens on the, on the call would like to, ah, Sumbo, would you like to say, say anything? Hi there. Um, I don't know if I could be heard. Welcome. Loud and clear. Oh yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'd say personally that it was it was a great opportunity, um, a good opportunity to connect with my environment in a, in a very different way. Um, as an architect who um, is involved in, I'd say spatial justice and um, very technicalized um, aspects of architecture. Getting to know about urban health for me was um, was very, very, very key. And I began to see space um, in a very different way and also began to see my role um, in a very different way and how I also contributed to the ecosystem um, as well. And the fact that it wasn't something that um, heavily on just one person, but it was a collective thing and that we needed to push um, we needed to put out the information to get other people involved because I also uh, realized that ignorance or not even knowing about some of these things were part of what was fueling the toxic cycle. And um, I'd also say that it also was um, a very educative experience. Um, I, I also had the opportunity to learn how to use um, sensors, which I'd always heard about, but I never really um, thought was necessary. But that opportunity was, was really, really key. And um, going forward, it's also something that I've also been able to um, let other people know about and let them see the importance of it and also see how it can be um, adapted to their own contexts. And um, yeah, I'd say that also the like-minded people that I was able to connect with was um, very exciting. And when I say like-minded, I don't mean that we're all in the same discipline. Um, it was quite a wide range of people. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we, we had economists there, we had um, gender advocates there, we had like environmental advocates, we had people who were into um, a lot of very different fields and, you know, coming together to see all of us um, work to achieve one goal and also drawing people within our networks in was something that um, was very, very, very um, interesting to see. And it's something that I think I would love to see going forward. Um, with the project. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Zumbo. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. Was there any of the other citizens on the call that wanted to share? Anyone else you spot the Tolu? Uh, who else is there? Toby, is that is that uh, our Toby? Or perhaps my colleague Monica, who is uh, kind of leading efforts to corral all the different uh, citizen scientists. If you have any thoughts, Monica, that of things I may have um, missed out on. Um, oh, hi everyone! Thanks, Dola. That was really nice. Um, I think just uh, to say that I'm really excited at this point in the project um, for further scaling up the model um, and working with stakeholders like um, like COEI and the Happy food dialogue, um, happy food link, sorry. Because um, what we realized is that, um, and I totally mentioned it, but there's so much untapped potential um, in our cities. 
Um, sometimes it's just a matter of connecting those dots and getting people access to those networks um, in order to make their voices get heard and to give them a platform to amplify their voices. Um, so yeah, so basically I'm just excited to be part of this initiative again and as we're going into the next few years of scaling up, expanding into the food space beyond the A yeah. Thank you. Oh, that is Toby, yeah, she is. Great. Thanks for sharing. Uh, last thing, there's a question for you in the chat. Uh, hey, Any yeah. ideas or thoughts about how you yes. carry these kinds of data collection models yeah. from the air quality space into the food and dietary space? Exactly. Thank you, um, Luke, for the uh, for the question. This is exactly what we're uh, working on the moment. So if you think about Essentially, within any of those environments, so think about a food environment. You're thinking about what are the what are the enablers and barriers to healthy eating, right? Or what do you see as what do you see as um, uh, um, risks in terms of climate vulnerability um, to your food environment? Um, this could be the, the foods that are sold, but it could also be the the infrastructure around the food. Right. So it could be um, the it could be the availability, the distribution. So highlighting equity and spatial equity is a uh, symbol alluded to. So how do we how do we start to think about the food environment around us? And how do we think about the ways that um, uh, climate uh, risks and climate vulnerabilities shape that. So, um, do you see any uh, physical barriers? Like, you know, what happens when it's what happens when you have flooding? What happens when there's extreme heat? What happens when? So it's this is this is a um, an adaptive exercise, right? Um, to understand the ways that uh, the, the kinds of aspects of the environment that influence um, what is what people what people have access to right um, it could be it could be into the retail space it could be into the food production space to understand well what what do you what do people see as um, as critical issues that need to be addressed um, the ways that the really important thing um, uh, with the digital infrastructure is not so much just the sensors, although there's the there's a sensor aspect of things, of whether that is um, uh, air pollution or heat um, or other kinds of sensors, but really critical are the data stories, and and this is what we really want to highlight. Like data is not just numbers; data is a lived environment. Um, and so that's why we've set it up to be able to capture um, photo, video, audio um, narrative. So we can look at, well, could we actually use that and start pushing the boundaries of thinking about how we understand um, the dynamic nature of our city. So can we use that to ask people about the experience of, 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 of food environments um, in the context of a climate hazard where something, something severe happens? Or can we use that to think about early warning system? Can we use that to aggregate um, indigenous ways of, of knowing and knowledge in terms in terms of protecting food production in the context of, of climate vulnerability. There's lots of different ways that this could go, but the, this is why the reason why we focus on the infrastructure is ensuring we have a very nimble um, uh, platform that allows us to tailor and instantly monitor so that we're not saying, oh, we have to find out what's happening in the city. Okay, we need to recruit 200 field workers and then we need to find funding and then we go out and then we spend two months collecting the data. And then by the time we actually analyze it, six months later, the environment has completely changed and that market isn't actually there anymore. So then what are we trying to do here? So the whole point of this infrastructure is how can we ensure we have a system that is nimble and is able to instantly sense um, the ways that um, our experiences are changing, the ways that our environments are changing, um, in in that in the ways that have repercussions both for sustainable sustainable um, for climate resilience, but also um, but also for our health and our access. So that is so I'll leave that to your imagination. It's a really it's it's endless where you can go with it, but the core aspect, the heaviest lifting, is actually bringing that infrastructure into being. If if I could add something, um, to that as well, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's it's a very very important question. 
But then again, just to um, echo a bit of what Professor Tolu said, I think that you also have to look at the agents and the actors in that space as well, because it's not just um, a one-man thing or it's not a one-man show. There's a process that um, food goes through. There's a process that people also put food through. And I think that um, interrogating these processes <clears throat> or maybe certain milestones along um, the food chain can also be um, a way that, you know, you could address some of those issues. But mind you, like Professor Toby said, because things are rapidly changing, um, the structure or the system or the strategy has to be adaptive such that, you know, it could keep producing uh, very relevant information that could be used or helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Simple. And I can actually add, um, of this mission, some work that we've done um, as part of the Global Diet and Activity Research um, Network um, that I direct. Um, we actually worked with high school students um, and asked them to tell us, and so not on this platform, but on a kind of an earlier model, tell us about their food environment that they encounter on their journey from home to school. So, on, so as they went from home to school, because Actually, you spend a lot of time in trans transit and in different cities, sometimes you, you traverse countries, right? If effectively, like your home environment and your school environment can be very different cities, right? Um, so we asked them to capture, um, and this could be the environment, it could be advertising, it could be, you know, it could be branding, it could be any kind of marketing, it could be issues of safety, it could be where their friends go. So they captured this on their journey at home and at school on their journey from home to school. And then we asked them, then we kind of started engaging with them. It's like, okay, what on that exposure and along that journey would help you eat better? What do you see as the risks that are, that um, that um that stop you from accessing it? In that study, we didn't go into the climate resilience, but you can see how you can extend it to say, well, what, what are the vulnerabilities that you see in your food environment on the journey that will help? You know what happens in in summertime what happens or oh, in the dry season what happens when there's flooding do these do some things go away do some things come back what happens when it's hot do you still have fresh vegetables and fresh fruit etc so these are the kinds of ways that you can have a system that then allows you to over time build information to see longitudinally over seasons how these things are changing and based on people's experiences not based on objective quote unquote um research Great, Donna. and yeah, just on your your comment around you know data is not just numbers, and I'm and I'm just thinking you know in terms of of uptake of of all of this you know this research and and data you know to to what extent you know maybe government and local government and city specifically you know at all um, were involved in 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 these in the particularly in the in the urban better um, initiative in these three African uh, cities at all because I think you know the the outcomes of these. Of these in initiatives can really be invaluable, I think, for you know, for planning processes, for example. Yeah, and we and we did do this, right? So one of the things we just started making noise um, before that, um, and in a couple of cities, the some of the key uh, city government actors came to part and said, "This is really great. How can we be part of it?" And then actually, in in Lagos, we had we now got a follow on um, project in partnership with the with the government that we kind of fundraise for, where we're looking at this and ex exactly at, at developing a participatory and, and institutionalizing this approach to say as this project is building an air quality management system how can we ensure it is by design participatory not like we do something and then we consult the youth right so we're actually building in this participatory approach and so and this came from them actually reaching out and this shows the power of that conspiring and the power of that aspiring because this this was to the credit of the citizens in, 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 in Lagos that kind of put it out there, that mobilized. And so this is what we're doing and we are ready to be part of the solution, but you have to make space for us. So, so we're seeing this over and over again, there's the opportunity is there. We just kind of have to show proof of concept and show that they, we, we're willing, we're keen to work together. Absolutely, love that. I think, yeah, such a, such a simple model with such great results, I think you know, I think we agree that if, if it could be upscaled, you know, I think it could go a long way in terms of uh, transforming our food systems for the better, at least in our city. So looking really much forward to it. Um, maybe I should keep quiet for a bit and open it up to the floor. Um, any there's other comments? Up. There's some in there's the up. chat. There's a hand up. Ah. 
Ivy is going to Ivy? Ahead. Ivy De Sousa, uh, please do go ahead. Yes. Sorry uh, for missing you there. Hello, please, can you hear me? Hello? Loud and clear, Ivy, go ahead. Okay, yeah, um, um, I just have a question for Oni. Uh, you've done a very great way, but I want to find out if you have uh, anything in your model, like giving alternative to people in terms of uh, them getting out of the bad practices. Because in the video you show on air pollution, I see somebody say something about charcoal and firewood, which is a major problem we have also in Ghana. But oftentimes these people have no other alternative. So whilst we advise them, I think we should also be thinking of alternatives. So I want to find as part of your program if there is any part of, uh, that gives alternatives. Thank you, Ivy. That's a really, really important point from a perspective of equity, mm -hmm. um, especially because it's very easy to wag our fingers and say, okay, we need to do X, Y, Z. It's like, well, how? And fundamentally, my experience is that human beings um, tend to gravitate towards the most rational decision, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and so we have to make it the easy choice. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is to just to emphasize that we know we in by no means trying to all en to encompass all aspects of, of this solution space. A core part of Urban Better is that conspire component is around collaboration, right? Um, this is where, this is the space that it opens up. So we don't do all of kind of developing all the solutions, et cetera, because you can't do everything, right? But the, this is really highlighting the importance of you create space, you amplify and you organize and you mobilize, but you also ensure that there is a platform for people to say, you know, imagine if on this call, somebody's like, oh, I've been thinking away, you know, you mentioned something about charcoal. Someone's like, oh, I've been developing this new model. Okay, how can I reach you? How can we meet in the middle, right? So that we can actually develop something together. So a core part of what we do is actually making space um, and, and fostering that kind of, um, conspiring there's the reason why we use conspire not collaboration because it's just it just I, it hits the point more like I need to conspire I come at it from this perspective you come at it from that perspective let's conspire together right so what you're saying is highlighting the importance of any individual uh, person or institution or platform, not going it alone, but recognizing, because otherwise we'll re reinvent the wheel. If I wanted to start today to say, oh, what are the charcoal alternatives? And I start today. I know there are lots of people working on this space for a long time, right? So rather say, we have this platform, we have these people who are keen to test out, we have this city government who are keen to try out, who is designing, who is developing interventions, and how can we actually match make and bring together the, the, um, the issues, the challenges with the solutions, bearing in mind, as you just rightly pointed out, equity. So okay. thank you, for, thank you for um, flagging that. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Very interesting and insightful. See there's some comments in the chat. Yeah, sorry, um, Jovin, by rational, I mean um, the most, it's, it's rational in that it is, it makes the most sense, right? And sometimes in the context of um, resource constraints, time poverty, what makes the most sense often is the path of least resistance, right? Um, so uh, I, you know, I am, my, my background is medical, right? Um, and I'm a public health physician and we're used to, just we we very we're very comfortable telling people what they should be doing, what they're doing wrong, and but we're not so good at kind of meeting people to say, you know what, actually what we're asking you to do is not very easy to do, right? Um, we can't place all the all the emphasis. Yes, there's a, uh, there is individual agency and behavior that is critical and awareness raising is, is really critical, but we also have to make sure that your environments are conducive for the behavior that we want to engender. So this is this is how I've ended up with Urban Better, right? So I used to tell my patients, oh, you need to walk more, you need to eat better. And I'd walk outside of the clinic and I was like, where? Where are you gonna buy food that is healthy here? How am I gonna tell you to, you know, you're working, you leave home at six in the morning, you get back at 9 p.m., there's nowhere easy around you to buy, buy healthy food. And I kind of shake my finger and go, oh, but you're not easy. 
this is not the way, right? We need to make the urban better so that the path of least resistance is actually the healthier and the most sustainable one. Absolutely. It's a powerful quote there in Love Tool. I think we'll, we'll definitely carve that into a quote. I think that's powerful to share. Uh, yeah, some comments from Luke, who totally agrees. Um, how you're approaching financially, financially resourcing this kind of collaborative conspiring once the spark has been lit in people's imaginations. I'm not sure if that's maybe a, a comment around financial resourcing this kind of collaborative conspiring um, yes. it's a difficult if you have one money, if, you have, if you have money Luke, um, you can send it my way <laughs> i accept all uh... <laughs> no but um it's it's a really important point because when you're talking about sustainability as a topic area we have to make sure that the initiative is also sustainable right so you don't want to start something that can't continue and again this is this is what is behind the mission of Urban Better, right? So there's, it, I started off as saying, okay, how do I do the things that I want to do and then I see as important? But we've moved into saying, well, how can we build the infrastructure just to make sure that this is something that people are not, we're not all trying to get the resources to build these big things, but that we have this resource that is then shared. Um, and so this is the approach that we're taking at the moment, quite frankly, Luke, we're looking at ways to, um, to seed that kind of funding and to create the space. So if we can build, and this is where we're developing these different demonstration projects, just to show and test out um, the theory of change and test out this, this um, impact pathways. And if we can show that, okay, look how from the individual and their self-agency right through to um, um, design and financing of how we shape cities, we can show the different ways that we can actually shape um, a new norm. This is this is part of the uh, this is part of the way that we raise the raise the capital to for others um, to leverage. So one of the things that we're doing is looking at how um, how to how to resource that right. So how how once we create that space and once we have that conspiring, how, once we have that matchmaking, how do we ensure that um, there's some kind of almost seed funding, if you like, for people to test things out? But again, this highlights the important role that governments play, and I think it's important that we don't sidebar that this is an explicit role that that governments are there for. You're there for your your mission is human development, right? And so this is why a key part of what we do is working very early with the government to say, if we can show this is valuable, right, for you, and it aligns with your mission of what you're trying to do, then you come to the party and you actually um, take it on and take it over. We don't have to hold on to it at all. We're not looking, we're not looking to do that. <laughs> we're looking, very much looking to let things go as quickly and effectively and as efficiently as possible. Awesome. Yeah, I think the, the conversation around around financing, you know, that's it's, it's it's always a tricky one and, and an interesting yeah. one. I think, uh -huh. particularly particularly in the in the context of cities, you know, I think, yeah. you know, it's such a it's such a tricky one. It's such a complex, I think, issue. Uh, financing, you know, I mean, cities are, you know, you'll hear, you know, we don't have the money. You know, where do we need to look? And I think, you know, this kind of thinking makes or forces city. And I think us in the development space as well to think more innovatively about you know, yeah. how we finance, I think, sustainable solutions. And I think, yeah, there's an interesting session around sustainable finance as part of the festival on Thursday. So please yeah. do check out the program there if you if you want to sort of indulge in that in that uh, discourse a bit more, but also to share some of those learnings, I think, to all of us on the, on the call. I think that would be quite insightful. Maybe, Ryan, just the last thing um, to mention, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the cost the cost of action, we spend a lot of time on that. But what we don't spend a lot of time on is the cost of inaction. And this is partly, this is partly why um, some of the evidence that we generate is just looking at, well, if we say, can we, afford, we can't afford to, my question is always, can we afford not to? Um, the challenge with the kinds of exposures that we work on is that um, they're not immediate, right? Um, the un unsustainable, unhealthy food environment, you slowly see the impact over time, right? Unhealthy access to clean air or non-walkable public spaces, you see, you don't see like, it wasn't, it's not like the pandemic where this, hap this exposure happens and then the incubation is five to seven days and then you start seeing people getting sick. But we saw, 
during the pandemic, we saw the, how the impossible became possible. We saw how different levels of collaboration across sectors because there was a sense of urgency. Um, and so unearthing the, the cost of inaction is really critical. There was some, some work that was done by um, colleagues of the Clean Air Fund for air pollution, for example, that found that, you know, um, the cost of, like in, in, um, in Lagos alone, the cost of air pollution in one year was almost 3% of its GDP, right? Um, there was a World Bank report that showed that in of the, of the people that died due to air pollution in Lagos, 50%, over 50% of them were in under fives, under five-year-olds. So when we start talking about whether or not we can afford to act, are you kidding me? Can we afford not to? So how do we generate kind of information like that for food, right? What is the cost of, what's the cost of inaction? What is the cost of obesity? What is the cost of stunting and malnutrition? And then let's have another conversation, right? And then, and who needs to, and as Sumbo alluded to, who, who are the actors that need to play a role, right? So food is not just about the food sector. Food is about the finance sector. Food is about trade. Food is about so much more because food is increasingly transboundary, right? So is a lot of food systems across different boundaries. So we need, we need good leadership, right? To say, this is actually what we're trying to, and this is why we start with Aspire. We can't, we have to first aspire to a city where sustainable food systems and, and, and we have, we're transforming our food systems um, all the way across the systems chain is something that we value, right? The second, we only prioritize cars, we only prioritize money, we prioritize, we lose the one thing that we have that is growing and that we're rich in, which is human development, right? Um, so, so this is so the, the financing is a whole other, you know, yeah. it, it's a whole other issue that is. Uh. <laughs> the, the cost of inaction. Can we afford? Can we afford not to act? I think that's that's so profound. Yeah, it's thought provoking as well. You know, I, I think, especially in the development phase, if you if you think about it that way, you know, you you sort of think, gosh, we've we've come such a long way in terms of of sort of crafting this. You know this the sustainable part that we should be on uh, but are we are we really being cognizant of, of you know those sort of other things that we so easily sweep under the rug and, and so easily forget that's so impactful um so yeah the cost of inaction i think is extremely powerful just looking at the chat some more thoughts shared there around co-financing models i think a good one and we hear it a lot um, particularly around governments uh some resources being shared there um yeah great discussion anybody else have some some final thoughts um it's been very enriching uh we always find ourselves running out of time with these sessions i'm glad we have a lot of time to to actually have an in-depth discussion so please please make use of the opportunity um to to share your thoughts Tolo, maybe maybe while we wait some some thoughts on you on the on the youth ambassador program specifically um excited for that definitely i am i mean when when I heard about this and thought on me I was like oh my gosh this is it's so great and also to hear that it is you know, it's coming at the start and it's not just that it exists, but the integral role it plays as part of the bigger project is a really critical one. And secondly, just the, the power of connecting them to others, right? So you, as a youth ambassador, it's not just you and what you're doing, right? That's really critical. But the magic, um, in my experience, comes when you take that, that um, enfranchised person, that activated person, that impatient for impact person and you bring them together um and 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 really um the one thing i would uh <laughs> the one thing i would say is maybe just to look out for um impacts that you didn't anticipate good impacts that you didn't anticipate because this is one of the things that uh, and create space for it because sometimes when we're shaping these things it's like okay this will happen and then you'll do this and we'll do that and in part because you have to report it to the funder that we did this and this and that but there is there is 
such importance of creating space to allow the magic to flourish and to give them the agency to say, okay, yes, this is what we need to do. But I just had, we just had two of us were speaking, we just had another idea and we want to do this. And just how do you create space for that? Um, someone once uh, told me in actually from Lagos, I was, I was talking about how one of the citizens had kind of run with it and was doing something else that I wasn't aware of. And he said, you know, you know, you're onto a good thing in Lagos when your, when your plan is hijacked. And I'm like, yes, we need to design in hijack, right? Into the, into the, <laughs> into the program to make sure and to encourage um, that because this is where, because I don't know what I don't know, right? So I have an idea. But then when you bring people together, what comes comes through from different perspectives, as Simba, Simba was alluding to different sectors, different life experiences, but also different cities, even within the city, same city, different context. Honestly, we don't know what we don't know. And so we just need to create a good bit of space um, for, that, for that X factor. So it's that X factor I'm most, I am always most excited, excited about. Absolutely. Thanks for that. Completely resonates. I think you know, you just sort of just summarize, I think, our creative thought process when we try to, to put this thing together, you know, you you sort of, yeah, you're sort of crafting a program for, for youth ambassadors to be sort of active over a four-year period. Um, and then you sort of find yourself, you know, also, you know, being very cognizant that you don't want to sort of be limited, you know, in sort of providing a scope that sort of limits, that limits the participation, but rather, as you say, you want these, these sort of um, activations, if you, if you want to call it that, um, to come out organically. So, so I think you know the last thing we want to do is is be limiting in, in in terms of the scope. So, so absolutely looking forward to that, and we'll take some of those learnings um, on board. Um, absolutely, and maybe with that, maybe um, some final thoughts, maybe from from Cine. Um, with that, I guess you also excited as you're going to be holding this program um, for youth ambassadorship across the continent. Massive um, job, I think, but massive opportunities. So we must be very excited. So maybe just some final thoughts there. Um, as towards the close of the session. Yeah, definitely, Ryan. I am quite excited. I think I'm even more excited that we have Tula on board. Um, I think she will have many contributions on this ambassadorship. So I look forward, Tula, to also working with you. Um, I look forward also to getting the youth ambassadors on board, as I have mentioned, that um, we're still in the shortlisting um, process. And we will definitely keep in mind that um, do not limit ourselves, just allow everything to flow organically. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Sine. Uh, Tolly, you've, 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 I know you've spoken a lot, uh, but maybe just some final reflections and then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll um, close the session. Okay. So, yeah, so I was just actually uh, just about to type, but I didn't realize I had final words, that I'm... I think it's important, obviously, this is an Afri-food links and simple food systems, but I think it's important that we retain that systems approach. So I always situate what I do within the kind of broader planetary health framework or, you know, some people have one out from planetary health, um, but situating to say, okay, you have these youth ambassadors that are the food ambassadors, but how can we situate them within a broader universe of a majority demographic activated for sustainable transformation, right? Um, so connecting that food side of things to the air quality, to the built environment, um, to public space is something that I think um, has a potential to, to build on each other, right? So that we learn tactics and exchange tactics from different sectors. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I, I can see how this can grow into something that um, that connects all these different uh, components of, of of planetary health and of health and climate resilience together and breaks down the silos of sectors um, so that uh, the majority demographic are perpetually working um, together um, to shape to shape our cities. Absolutely. What a note to end up on. Um, big thank you, Tolu. Um, Victor in his absence and, and Sine for, yeah, for, for indulging us um, and engaging us today. I think it sparked real um, interest and conversation um, around, around um, the massive important topic around youth, youth um, centered youth perspectives around 
transforming food, but transforming, I think, Africa as a continent as a whole, transforming the world. I think we, um, through the eyes and through the lens of youth, I think we, we're in good hands. I think we have an important job um, on this call as participants to, to keep this, this agenda alive. Um, to support um, through the initiatives of the Urban Betters, the Afri Foodlings Youth Ambassador programs. Um, let's keep doing what we're doing. Um, let's keep in touch. Um, let's grow our networks. And again, a big thank you to our speakers and everyone for participating and attending this live session. Um, we would ap uh, appreciate you giving us feedback um, on how it went. A very short uh, two minute survey, which we'll um, share in the chat. Um, and as always, to, to help us make every RISE event um, and others better. And then just lastly, just to make sure that you um, please do enjoy the rest of the festival. Um, you can join our daily debrief at six this afternoon, where we'll sort of um, give a little summary of the day. Um, and then sort of that will take us into another exciting day tomorrow. So yeah, we'll share the link to the survey, the link to the daily debrief in the chat. Um, and with that, again, everyone, a massive thank you from me and the Eagle Africa team. And uh, looking forward to seeing you guys um, at work. So all the best and goodbye.